This is NICU Babies Parent Support with Katherine Whitaker, a podcast from Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit that provides free personalized support, resources, and community before, during, and after a NICU stay. My conversations here will focus on education and personal stories with medical and hospital professionals, counselors, therapists, and NICU moms and dads from across the country. Whether you're preparing for a NICU stay, you're currently there, or your months and years past your stay, you belong here. The NICU is hard. We're here to help. I'm your host, Katherine Whitaker, the mom of six children, including my very own NICU baby, and I'm so honored you're here. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm always happy that you're here. You know, the month of August has had us talking about a lot of things. We definitely talked about school because, hello, it's either starting or it already has for you. And we definitely spoke about breastfeeding. I've had a few guests last week. We talked about milk banks and how you can donate your milk if you have extra supply or you may be the beneficiary of someone who's donated their milk. But I really wanted to address you, the mom who may have may want or may be choosing to breastfeed your child, but you find yourself in a really stressful place, the neonatal intensive care unit. And it sort of feels like when you get there, all the things that you may have walked in caring or knowing about breastfeeding sort of get thrown out the window because it's a whole new thing. Breastfeeding's one thing, NICU's one thing. You put those together and you're like, what did I get myself into? So I wanted to visit with someone who had expertise in both of those things. She has expertise in neonatology with an emphasis in breastfeeding but also as a mama who breastfed and encountered some challenges of her own. So I think that we are really going to speak into supply and what do you do if you're there, but you need some help. And so what are some things that you should be asking? So I know, and I hope that this particular episode is going to give you some great things that you can use practically speaking like today, right now in the NICU, but also when you leave the NICU and how you can continue to get the support that you need. Today's guest is Dr. Leah Jordan. She's a board certified pediatrician from Minnesota who loves supporting NICU moms in reaching their breastfeeding goals. She's in her final months of neonatology fellowship at the University of Minnesota and like in a few weeks, will be joining as a neonatologist at Children's Minnesota. Her research centers on the use of quality improvement methods methodology to promote breastfeeding in the NICU and beyond. And with that, let's chat. Well, Leah, thank you for joining me. I am always thrilled to hear how people find their way in whatever specialty they may have. And you, while you're a board certified pediatrician, you're about to be like a big fancy neonatologist. So what is it that led you to medicine in the first place? And then how did you find yourself in neonatology? What was the draw there? Yeah, I feel like some of these answers for me are cliche. Um, The why medicine, I always just really loved science and really loved people. And it seemed like a very natural way to combine those two passions. As far as why neonatology, I knew pretty early on in medical school, like there was no way I'm taking care of adults, but I love families. I love getting to take care of families in really stressful situations and also really joyful situations. And neonatology has let me combine those two. On any given day, I can take care of some of the sickest babies around and also babies that are, you know, at the end of their NICU journey and getting ready to go home. And it's just a really lovely balance um, for me personally and um, such a joy to be with family. So thanks for having me on. And yeah, thanks for being. I'm happy to have you. We keep hearing this recurring theme that people go into their specialties because they don't just want to care for the patient, but they also want to care for the family that you get this time with them that you don't typically get in other places and spaces. And I love that you're fresh, like brand new um, (laughs) doctor, almost um, neonatology. So where will you be? in the fall. Yeah. So I am currently in my fellowship at the University of Minnesota, and I will be joining um, Children's Minnesota uh, local NICU after I graduate. So Wonderful. exciting. Exciting. Well, enjoy the snow. I'll send the warm weather from <laughs> Texas up to you. <laughs> it's about 55 degrees here and uh, gray, but no snow. <laughs> well, praise the Lord for that. Um, yeah. I'm curious. So I know that sometimes when you go into medicine, you typically have something that you're really passionate about. I mean, and that sometimes comes from our family of origin or sometimes our life experiences. But I know that you have a real passion for breastfeeding and health equity. And I would love to know why those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really um, 
normal when you have trained in a pediatric residency um, that when it's time to have your first baby, you're like, yes, I'm going to follow all of the American Academy of Pediatric breastfeeding recommendations. I'm going to exclusively breastfeed until one, um, two beyond whatever works for my family. Um, and so I, I knew that going into my first child, my son, Dominic was born um, when I was a second year pediatric resident oh, wow. and we had a pretty rocky pregnancy um, similar to, I'm sure some of the listeners today, um, I had multiple trips to antepartum. I was admitted to um, labor and delivery with preeclampsia and induced earlier than I expected. He was kind of a wimpy little five and a half pounds. And while we didn't have to go to the NICU, we had a lot of those same NICU breastfeeding struggles, nipple shields, triple feeding, a lot of pumping, and a lot of feeling like this isn't what I thought I was getting into. Um, we eventually, you know, got beyond those early weeks and months, and it was time for me to return to work. And returning to work in a pediatric residency means working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. It was a lot of pumping. It was a lot of separation for my baby. And again, it wasn't really what I expected breastfeeding to look like. At the same time, I would come home from these long shifts and having that relationship with my son meant so much to me. And so while it was a really hard journey, it was something that was incredibly meaningful to me as a mom and as a pediatrician. And while it was hard for me, I had really all the tools and the resources that you could ask for, right? Like I could get all the supplies that I needed. I knew exactly where every lactation consultant was in the metropolitan area. I knew how to get those appointments and could get kind of like added onto the schedule if I needed to. One of my best friends in pediatric residency is also an IBCLC, so a pediatrician and an IBCLC. And she happened to have a baby just a week or so before Dominic was born. And so we were on maternity leave at the same time and like awake feeding babies at the same time in the middle of the night. And so coming into fellowship with that experience of breastfeeding being not what I expected, it being hard and having all the resources, my heart just goes out to a lot of the moms that I see in the NICU who maybe don't have that same access to resources or don't have that same access to support. The literature in the NICU tells us that um, while many, while moms really have the same kind of goals to breastfeed a baby in the NICU, they know the benefits of it. They want to provide um, that milk for their baby. The ability to do so is really dependent on a lot of factors. What your family of origin support is, what your community support is, when you have to go back to work. And do you have even paid time to pump or to take leaves? Do you have that support when you return to work from your family? Um, and so, there are some really well-known racial disparities in rates of breastfeeding in the NICU. And I really just want all moms to be able to have the support, the encouragement, and the empowerment that I felt to have the breastfeeding relationship that is right for their family. So when you talk about, first of all, let's define IBCLC because not everybody oh, yeah. may know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so an international board certified lactation consultant. So they're like go. the highest degree specialty um, in lactation consultants or people to help with breastfeeding. I love uh, NICU moms are no strangers to acronyms. So as long as we know what it stands for, then we can use it. So yeah. you were talking about this racial disparity of some moms getting more support than other moms. What are some things that are happening in NICUs now to sort of shorten um, that big disparity and make it smaller? Yeah. Um, so some things that I've been working on in my units, um, we have set up these breastfeeding supply closets. So breast milk might be free, but like the hands-free pumping bra or the pump that you have so or the bags and all of the like tools and equipment that make breastfeeding easier, more convenient, more possible, those can be cost prohibitive. And so um, we've had a lot of foundation and funding support to be able to provide those to families. Um, other things that we're working on is just like, let's level the playing field with education. I think sometimes um, healthcare teams, even with the best intentions, make assumptions about who they think are going to breastfeed and who is not going to breastfeed. And when the unit gets busy, it's a lot easier to put the time into conversations around breastfeeding with a family that you really think wants to do it. And if there's a family that you're you're not getting that same, they came in here intending to breastfeed, you might skip those conversations. And so just calling to mind for everyone that we work with, like this is a bias that we all hold and being aware of it, we can overcome it. 
Um, we're also doing some staff training. So um, I've developed this really exciting trauma-informed lactation care course where we get to use some of the principles of trauma-informed care to really empower and support moms in what can feel like an emotional journey. I'm glad that you mentioned assumptions because I think not only are there assumptions about who can breastfeed, but you mentioned it at the very beginning talking about I'm assuming that I'm walking into a NICU experience and I'm going to know what to do. So when I walked into the NICU, I'd had four previous babies breastfed with virtually no problems. And then I had this brand new baby and it was not working. And I yeah. felt like such a failure as a mom. And and I was someone who like knew the drill. I knew how to do it. Yeah. So Leah, when you're thinking about women who are getting ready to either, they know that they're going to have a NICU stay or they find themselves there unexpectedly. Let's talk a little bit about overcoming some of those challenges. Like what can moms expect with a NICU baby? I know a lot of it depends on um, the size of the baby weight-wise, but also the age of the baby and how many weeks they are. But what are some things that a mom should know when she's walking into a NICU stay about breastfeeding? Yeah. So I think there are three kind of key questions to ask yourself going into a NICU stay about, about breastfeeding. One is your why, like knowing why you want to provide milk for your baby helps you to just keep that motivation there. Some things that I would share about breastfeeding in the NICU is the why behind why it's especially important for premature infants or kind of more medically complicated infants to get um, their mom's milk. We know that mom's milk is the safest, meaning it protects against infection. It provides protection against some serious blood infections and injury to the intestines. It's also the most easy to digest and helps really all parts of babies that are born early grow to their best potential. So preventing some of those complications of prematurity. That might be a different balance for your family, kind of the benefits of providing breast milk versus the effort of providing breast milk if your baby is very early or if your baby is born closer to term. Um, and so I would have those conversations with your neonatologist, with your baby's medical team about what they feel are the most important benefits um, around breast milk for your baby. It's also important to know, like, what am I coming into this NICU with? You had mentioned, you know, you've had those four previous breastfeeding relationships. And, and sometimes it's something that just means a lot to us from our family of origin, from our community, from our, from our culture. And when things have gone, you know, not according to plan, they've gone off script in pregnancy or in your delivery, it feels like, well, this is one thing that I can do. This is one thing I've done before. This is one thing that I can control. Um, and just like naming that and calling that out um, is, I think, really important for families. So we mentioned the why. The next is, you know, what is it going to look like? You mentioned there's a big difference between babies born closer to term and babies born early in terms of, you know, when they're ready to start getting milk in general, when they're ready to start eating by mouth. Um, and for some of those questions, again, I would really lean heavily on your neonatology team, on you know, the team that you're meeting before your baby's delivery or after to ask, what is it going to look like for my baby getting milk and starting to take breast milk directly? Yeah, we have that whole suck, swallow, breathe thing that they have to figure out. It's complicated, right? And yeah. it's it takes a lot of work. So yes, I can appreciate where you're coming from there. Yeah, absolutely. The last piece is like, what is this going to look like? And those are going to be factors like at your local hospital, where you deliver, in your community. Things like, what is the lactation team schedule? How many of them are there? When do they come to see moms? Do they come to see me automatically or do I have to schedule an appointment? It's things like, how do I get a breast pump here in this hospital with my insurance? And what are the pumps that this hospital recommends that can be different kind of depending on what your hospital's connection is to various medical suppliers? Um, and it also might be, you know, what kind of supplies can you provide me with? What supplies should I be getting on my own? What education do you have built into kind of your NICU admission and um, what pieces of education might I need to seek out on my own? I'm really glad that you mentioned the schedule because I do remember it's been 13 years since our baby was in the NICU, but I do remember looking at my nurse and saying, I, this isn't working and I, I've like trying all the things and it's still not working. So the next time that he's scheduled for a feed, you know, three hours, the NICU works on the three hour schedule. I said, yep. can you call the lactation consultant and can they meet me here? And um, I don't know that, that I was 
coach to do that. I think it was just like my mama bear instinct. But yeah, ask your nurse, when are they around and can they meet me? I wanted her there at the feeding because I was like, I want someone to look at all this and be like, is it working or not? Because my husband was like, uh, I can't help you. <laughs> so I was yeah. so grateful um, that we had that. But I know that sometimes it requires you naming it, saying, I actually, because I think they made the assumption, oh, she's had four kids. She knows what to do. And I was like, no. I do not know what to do. I'm I'm like a fish out of water here. Yeah. Um, and even if you weren't in the NICU, we're like every baby is different I with know. their breastfeeding journey too and those challenges. That's so true. So how can a mom, I mean, I know I asked my nurse, what are some other ways that a mom can advocate for good lactation and support? I think we are sometimes hesitant to do that because maybe we think that we're inconveniencing someone or that we should have it figured out. So yeah. what are some things that a mom can do to advocate for good support? Yeah. I think one, like we're mentioning, understanding the system. So know what the general flow of lactation support is in your hospital. When are they coming to see you? How do you have to get that appointment or do you have to book one at all? Know kind of what the peer support system is in your hospital. Peer lactation support um, is offered in a number of hospitals, a number of NICUs. It's an evidence-based way of um, promoting breastfeeding. And so it's a really great tool if you have one. Um, So asking about peer support programs is another great tool. The other thing that I would recommend is goal setting. So we know that goal setting related to breastfeeding in the NICU is really strongly associated with long-term breastfeeding success. Um, I like to break down goal setting into two kinds of goals. So there's the outcome goal, like I want to breastfeed until a year. And there's those kind of process goals, those steps along the way or the milestones. This week, I really want to do skin to skin twice. This week, I'm really hoping that I don't snooze my alarm at my middle of the night pumping session. (laughs) This week, I'm really hoping that, you know, I'm returning to work, that I get two pumps a day in while I'm back at work and um, then after work as well. And so having those kind of long-term goals, like what am I shooting for? What is what is the end game? And those short-term goals, what can I do about it today? Sharing those with your team can help them get on board. Like if your nurse knows you really want to do skin to skin, then they can help you do skin to skin. Right. If your nurse knows that you're sleeping through your pumps in the middle of the night, then maybe you set up a system where you call her in the middle of the night when you're up at one of the pumpings to hear about how your baby's doing and get some of that like positive reward. So I think sharing your goals, sharing those things that you're trying to do for the week um, can really help people partner with you and provide the support that you're looking for. I was doing just that at my 3 a.m. pumping. I was always calling the not nurse and they were always holding him. And I'm like, you you guys got to stop doing that. He's never going <laughs> to sleep through the night if y'all do that. This podcast is produced by Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit. But we're more than simply a podcast. Be sure to download our app, join one of our support groups or find one-to-one support, enjoy counseling, find loss and bereavement support, participate in a peer-to-peer mentor program, or check out our news, articles, and family stories at handtohold.org. All of that is at no cost to you. Hand to Hold's mission is to provide personalized support before, during, and after a NICU stay to help ensure that all NICU families thrive. I'm so glad that you mentioned um, your supply because... Like I said, I had nursed all these babies, had no problem with supply. Bam, we land ourselves in the NICU. And I think I underestimated the immense amount of stress that we were going to undergo and how my body was going to react to that stress. And so I just saw my milk came in and then all of a sudden my supply plummeted. And I panicked because he was a baby who had a really sensitive gut. And I knew that 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 was going to be the easiest thing for him. But supply became... A major thing. And here I am Googling everything on the internet, talking to IBCLC, like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. So if a mom is struggling with supply because she is stressed or for whatever reason, what are some things that you would suggest that she can safely do to boost her supply or, or times or things that she can either nurse or pump that might aid in boosting all of that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the amazing things with babies who are born on time and just 
catch on with breastfeeding right away is that they are telling your body exactly how much milk you need to make. They're like auto doing that whole process, all of the hormones yes. involved, all of the signaling involved. And so when you don't have the baby who's able to breastfeed directly successfully, do a lot of really great transferring, when you have some immaturity or a baby who's sick and can't go to the breast at all, you really have to be the one in control of that. And the good thing is it's actually a a pretty simple kind of process. You need to use the pump to replicate that baby saying, I'm here, I need milk. So it's supply and demand. Important things are to get started pumping really as soon as you are physically able after your delivery. So ideally, when a term healthy baby is born, they go to the breast right away, tells your body, I made a baby, I need to make milk for this baby, and it gets that hormone signaling going. The sooner after delivery with a baby who needs to go to the NICU that you can get that process started with pumping, with hand expressing, um, the better your body is going to get that signal. Can I, can I stop you there for, for just a second? So if a, a mom is new and she's yeah. pumping for the first time, like the baby's not on her breast and she's nursing, what should she expect when she, nur- when she pumps the first time? Like, yeah. is she going to get a bazillion ounces? I know the no. answer to this, but I want you to say it. So <laughs> I want to like give people some expectations of what they can yeah. expect when that first happens. I tell moms, it is normal in those first few days that you are going to see zero drops of milk whatsoever. If you get a drop, that is amazing. But in those first few days of pumping, what you're really doing is sending the signal to your body, I made a baby, I need to make milk. What you should see is slowly over the course of the first three, five, seven days, the amount of milk that you get goes from tiny little droplets that are thick and yellow and sticky to more and more kind of puddles in the bottom of your bottles that get bigger and bigger and whiter and brighter. Um, And that's a normal transition to making milk. The key to making that happen is pumping consistently. So we generally recommend about eight times a day, no more than about a five-hour stretch at night. It's really important that your body is getting that consistent hormonal signaling to make milk. And this is really phoning in your order for what your future supply should be like. We know from studies that the amount of milk a mom makes at about two weeks after her baby is born is the amount of milk that she's really going to make. That's where she's kind of set the point at for her body. Um, And so the goal is to get up to what a term healthy baby is going to need for breastfeeding for months to come. Generally around 800 to 900 milliliters or like 27 to 30 ounces a day is what you're shooting for. You mentioned low supply and, you know, what do we do if, um, if my milk doesn't seem like it's coming in the way that it should. Yeah. Again, the number one thing is going to be that supply and demand. So making sure, you know, that you're logging okay, I think I'm getting in eight pumps a day, but let me write it down. Oh, I'm actually only getting in six to seven and I'm kind of tending to sleep through and going a little bit longer of a stretch at night. That's really the first place that I would put your energy for trying to troubleshoot that low supply. The next things I would think about is, um, and talk about with your team, with the lactation consultants, with your baby's doctors, like, is there any medicines or complications that I had during my pregnancy that might make my supply a little slower to come in or not come in as robustly? Um, and that's going to be different for every woman, but we know things like high blood pressure and needing to be on blood pressure medicines. Those are some common culprits having a, uh, difficult C-section, losing a lot of blood, again, similar common culprits. Um, I often get asked about, you know, different medications, galactagogues, teas, cookies, different things like what can I eat? What can I drink? Yes. Um, none of those are going to work if you're not getting in those frequent number of pumps, right? You need those hormonal signals that are more powerful than any supplement or medicine you're going to take. Um, Some of them are more safe than others, especially when you have a baby that's in the NICU and might already have some, you know, medical complications or sensitivities um, with digestion. And so I'd really lean on your lactation consultant and your baby's doctor to help you navigate. You know, I have trouble shot. I am doing all my pumps. I am putting in all my time um, and I'm not seeing milk come in. What would be my next steps? And I'll add, you are going to drink a ridiculous amount of water as a nursing yeah. mom. There's uh, those big jugs that they give you when you come in the hospital. In fact, I was laughing with a friend the other day. She was drinking out of one. I was like, I remember those and they're so good. Um, but yeah, just drinking a ton of water and yeah. being a nursing mom means that you're not keeping banker's hours. <laughs> you are pumping yeah. in the middle of the night yeah. um, to get your supply back up. 
I heard you mention stress and some of that stress around yes. breastfeeding and how that can play into your milk supply. Obviously, you if you're in the NICU, you're probably recovering from your own complications with delivery and um, your own recovery and prioritizing your sleep and good nutrition and rest is really important. Um, I would also say that there's some good evidence behind different relaxation techniques and stress reduction techniques for milk supply. Um, one thing that I, I commonly hear is like, I just stare at the bottles and I see that the milk's not coming and then I get worried and then I keep getting worried and the milk never comes. So a, a good trick for that is just covering the bottles. Don't look at them. Don't mm -hmm. don't be focused so. on the milk. Um, looking at pictures of your baby or being bedside with your baby can be really helpful for getting that um, good rush of um, you know happy hormones. And um, then different techniques like guided meditation or deep breathing techniques can also be really helpful. Um, so wherever you you find support in that is a, a great resource too. I love that. Those are really good suggestions. I know that some moms find themselves, it could be that because their baby's in the NICU for so long, so they do a lot of pumping and then they find themselves with bags and bags and gallons and gallons of milk. So what what should a mom or what can you expect if you are, maybe your baby's not quite ready to eat or maybe they're NPO, so nothing by mouth. I forgot. I had to look it up in Latin, what it stood for. That's what I wrote it down. Is I'm going to say it wrong, but nil par os. Anyway, that's where NPO comes from. Yeah. Why we have these acronyms that don't match up with English, I don't know. But at <laughs> any rate, um, so yeah, so maybe your baby's NPO and you're, you've got all this milk. So does this does the hospital, are they required to store that? Do they only keep a certain amount and you need to take some home? That's liquid gold. So I certainly don't want a mom to be throwing out any of that milk. So what can a mom expect if she's got a lot of milk and the baby's not consuming it just yet? Yeah, it is such a labor of love to be pumping when your baby is not getting um, milk at all or not getting very much milk and you see this milk building up. It's a real act of faith and of hope in um, kind of the coming days when your baby is able to get that. And so I just want to speak like affirmation into a mom that's facing that um, situation right now. In terms of storage, every hospital is going to be a little bit different in how much milk they can store. But in general, there is a refrigerated section of milk that's going to get used in the next couple of days. And then there's a freezer section where you can store um, potentially more milk than that. I always recommend that um, families just communicate really closely with their bedside nurse. They're the one who is preparing every feeding, who's thawing out milk when it's time for a feeding. And they're going to have the best pulse on like how much milk you have in storage at the hospital and how much space there is for more milk. So if you know, hey, I'm going to be at the hospital tomorrow, just let your nurse know that you're coming and say, how much milk should I bring? How many bottles should I bring with me? Or are you guys good on supply? Remind remind me of the um of how many days I, I think there's a number that goes with it. How many days in the fridge, how many days in like a side by side freezer, and then how many months in like a big, huge, like deep freeze? What's kind of the barometer of how long you can store your milk before it goes bad? Yeah. Um hospitals might have slightly different rules about this because we don't always have um, perfect evidence for the things we do. I would say in the refrigerator is generally about four days for fresh milk. In a freezer is generally about six months, like side by side, regular freezer, and then 12 months in um, a chest freezer or a deep freezer. Yeah. And moms, make sure you label your milk because you'll think, oh, I'll remember that. Get yourself a marker. <laughs> Put yes. that on there. And many NICUs will give you like labels or barcodes, things that they scan to kind of keep track of things in the system. It might have your baby's name or your name, um, but all really helpful kind of hospital specific things for labeling. Um, the other thing that I recommend like I mentioned, um, checking in with your bedside nurse if I need to bring milk, but also maybe let them know like, hey, we're going to be out of town this week, so I'm not going to be able to bring milk. Kind of some of the barriers that you might have in the coming week to either milk production or milk transportation. I always feel so awful when it isn't caught until, oh man, we're down to the last bottle and we don't have any more of mom's milk and it's the middle of the night, it's 2 a.m. Um, and so I... I I take responsibility for that when it happens, um, but I also want to share that with families so they can help advocate, making sure that they've got the right amount um, at the hospital or, or the best amount for their family. 
Some families get to a point where they have so much milk that it doesn't all fit at the hospital. Like they can't store it all there. <laughs> I see you laughing. It seems like maybe yeah. that happened to you. It took four <laughs> nurses to carry out the milk that I was, our son was NPO for weeks. And so it took a lot of, my nurses were like, uh, so we're going to have to call in some extra support. It's like, I got a lot of milk. <laughs> that is a, a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, I frequently hear from families who are like, we don't have any more freezer space. Should I just get rid of the milk? Never don't get rid that. of the milk. Don't do that. <laughs> um, some things that um, I've advised is, you know, do you have any family members with extra freezer space where you can put some bags of milk in their freezer? Um, Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or wherever you kind of get things used. Often you can find really inexpensive chest freezers. Um, and sometimes your NICU hospital uh, might be able to have other solutions for you as well. So don't throw it yeah. away. No, and certainly if you have enough, you might even be able to donate it to a milk bank. We have an episode coming up on that and about banking milk and how what a blessing that can be for families. Yeah. I always ask Leah this question of my guests at the end, because I think your advice is always um, what people resonate with the most. So if there is a mom who's listening, who um, is anxious about breastfeeding her baby in the NICU, what advice would you give to her? Yeah. I just want to say that I see you and I I see your worries and your fears. I think it's really common in the NICU, especially when there have been complications during pregnancy and delivery, this like overwhelming sense of my body has failed me or I did something wrong or this is my fault. And when breastfeeding or nursing doesn't go the way you expected, it can just compound those feelings of inadequacy, of shame, of fear, of feeling like you don't have control. And so I just want to say to to moms who feel like that is the source of their worries and their fears, that this is nothing that you did. This is nothing that you didn't do. This isn't your fault. Um, you're a good mom. And this isn't the measure of your success. The amount of milk you make, the number of days you breastfeed, the number of times you directly breastfeed, none of that is the measure of your worth as a mom. You're a good mom. That is the perfect way to end it. Leah, thank you so much for all your good advice. Well, y'all, that was an episode chock full of really good advice and really good action items for you. If you find yourself in the NICU and you want to breastfeed, but you are feeling overwhelmed, stressed out, low supply, whatever it may be, I hope that we allayed some of those fears and concerns. In today's two-minute take, I think I just wanted to speak in to this, is that when you add a NICU stay on top of a breastfeeding journey, it's a lot, moms. It's It can be a lot. And I don't want you to be shy or to feel like you're doing it wrong if you find yourself asking for help. I know that it took a lot. It, 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 honestly, it finally took a lactation consultant looking at me like she put her hands on my shoulders and she's like, Catherine, it is okay to ask for help. Because I was sitting there in that chair feeding after feeding getting more and more frustrated. Why can't I do this? Why is this not working? This is supposed to be natural. It's hard and nothing's working. And I want you to know that breastfeeding is hard in and of itself. And then you add a NICU stay and it becomes doubly hard. But there are lots of resources at the hospital that can help you, whether it's a lactation consultant. There's a website actually that Lee and I didn't mention, but I want to mention it because it's post like when you leave the NICU and you find yourself running in to challenges and concerns, what do you do? It's called lactationnetwork.com and it can connect you based on some of the criteria that you have with a lactation consultant. Do they take your insurance, whatever you're looking for, and it pairs you with someone that can help you post NICU because sometimes your pediatrician can help you with that. But sometimes those visits are few and far between when you're trying to get an answer to a feeding like today, like <laughs> we got a baby that needs to eat in a TikTok, TikTok, like 20 minutes. So what do I do? So I think that that can be a great resource for you. But, but I just want you to give yourself some grace. And as Leah said, and I think it's worth reiterating that the value of you as a mom is not dictated by how much milk you pump or how successful you are at breastfeeding. You are the mama and you are doing all the right things. Just keep going. So I continue to be an advocate for breastfeeding. I know it can be such a great gift for our babies, particularly those who have trouble when it comes to digesting. But I also believe that a fed baby is best. 
So however that may look for you, know that you're doing what's best for your baby. And if you choose to breastfeed, know that there are so many resources, particularly if you find yourself in the NICU and feeling overwhelmed, you are not alone. And with that, I will see y'all next time. Thanks y'all for listening to NICU Babies Parent Support. Every parent and every experience is welcome here. If you are a NICU parent and you're finding yourself in need of support, please download our app. You can find it in the Apple Store or on Google Play, Hand to Hold. And if you love today's episode, you can share it, you can subscribe, and you can most certainly review it. We would love, love, love your reviews. It's how we reach more NICU parents. Thanks, and I'll see y'all next time.